Thank you guys for showing up. Um, is this a good distance? Yeah. Uh, thank you to uh, various people. My agent, Jim Rutman, my editor, Milson Bennett, who is not only battling a cold, but a human growing inside her <laughs> and still showed up. Um, and various people who helped with this book along the way, my parents as well. Um, I'm going to read something short and lighthearted that was uh, very new that I'll read from the book. And then Kate and I will, I guess, sit there and reenact scenes from Masterpiece Theater <laughs> for you guys. Um, so, and then, yeah, this is it. Here we go. It's called I'm an English Professor in a Movie. Good morning and welcome to Advanced English Literature. I'm Professor Anglo sounding name. As you can see, I have a mane of silver hair and wear a corduroy blazer with leather elbow patches, stitched with corduroy threads that have their own leather thread patches, and pace briskly into this lecture hall from the New England autumn just as class starts. I'm waiting sternly as the laggards straggle in like Leopold Bloom wearily climbing to his bed in the Penelope episode of Ulysses. Yes, I expected you all to laugh at that impromptu erudite quip. <laughs> With the exception of one newcomer, that Midwestern freshman in the middle row, looking around anxiously with her neatly arranged panoply of multicolored pens, wondering if she's out of her depth because she can't understand an offhand literary joke at this elite institution which is, once again, in New England, take a quick establishing gander at the outside foliage. Turn to the student on your left. Now turn to the student on your right. The odds are that one of you can't do it all the way and thus has serious neck rotation problems. I know, good chiropractor. I will accept nothing but your finest work in this class. Even though American academe has produced a generation of professors whose career status is far more dependent on publishing than pedagogy, and who, once they receive tenure, basically phone it in until retirement. Nevertheless, everything you've heard that's intimidating about me is true from upperclassmen who refer to me in foreboding tones solely by my surname. To whom does that ringing cellular phone belong? I use whom accurately and don't end sentences on prepositions because I'm an English professor. I'll just walk toward the sound and eventually locate its source. I can't imagine it's that Midwestern freshman who is currently squirming in her seat with perspiration dotting her brow. I'll approach her anyway, and if the phone continues chiming, I'll know she's the culprit. It's still jingling that benighted popular music ringtone. I'm just a few feet away now, inching along as if I'm in some decelerated temporality. Humph! it stopped ringing just as I reached her. Now that there's silence, I can no longer punish the guilty party, whoever it is. It's time for my lecture on a well-known book everyone read in high school or has at least already heard of. I'll discuss an obvious theme while deploying a few highfalutin words, such as deploying and highfalutin. <laughs> and perhaps my address will contain a few metaphorical corollaries to what that Midwestern freshman is currently experiencing in her own life. Her head will tilt up and her eyes will widen in recognition as I speak indirectly about her situation with that boy in her dormitory hall. To summarize, Captain Ahab's tragic flaw is his monomaniacal pursuit of the white whale that blinds him to all else. And by obsessively pining away for the handsome, blonde, all-American quarterback, Chris, who's using you to write his history papers for him as actually a jerk, you're ignoring your intelligent, bespectacled, nerdy lab partner, Simon, who's assisting you in a completely ethical way with your project on chemical bonds, another metaphor, and is a really good listener. <laughs> I'll take this precise moment the Midwestern freshman is distracted by a smugly obnoxious classmate to call on her. She clearly hasn't heard my question, so rather than repeat it in full, I'll simply over-enunciate and ask, what do you think? And she'll grope for words and perspire again, and finally answer nonsensically, yes, smugly obnoxious classmate, that is the single correct answer to what Ishmael symbolizes. Well, five minutes have elapsed, so class must be over. Furthermore, the rustling of your knapsacks as you prepare to leave reminds me of Odysseus's men yearning to remain in the land of the lotus eaters, except the exact opposite. I'll pause here for your sophisticated chortles. Note that I began with a humorous allusion to Ulysses and ended with a gracefully worded one to its precursor, the Odyssey. As the callow youth say these days, in a manner I will sardonically emulate, that's just how I roll. You may all LOL. 
if the Midwestern freshman approaches me after class, I do hope she stammers insecurely while asking a question I'll dismiss that reeks of naivete. But imagine the triumphant arc at the end of the semester when, with a subtle nod of curmudgeonly respect, I hand back her term paper on Moby Dick with a circled A plus and whisper in her ear, remember to turn it off your phone before class. As you depart, I'll call out next week's assignment, even though you all have it on your syllabi and the act of shouting is incongruous with my profession and age. Don't forget your essays on the theme of coming of age in all of Western literature. Thank you. <laughs> So I'll just read something short from um, Johnny Valentine, or Teddy Valentine, as I call it sometimes. <laughs> um, I assume, I, I know most of you, so most of you probably know what this is about. It's about an 11-year-old pop star who's on tour across America. In this scene from the middle of the book, uh, Johnny has escaped his Memphis hotel room with the Latch Keys, who are an indie rock band that is opening for him. And he very much admires uh, Zach Ford, who's their lead singer. And it's pretty much the first time he's gotten out of the bubble that he's trapped in. So this is, uh, they're already in the nightclub in this section. We were in a roped off section that had another bouncer guarding it, with 30 or 40 people in our area, and a lot more in the rest of the room, either talking or dancing to the DJ, who was playing some bad hip hop song. I forget the rapper's name, but it was one of those where the guy tries to sing and he doesn't have the range. I want to be like, stay in your element. You don't see me trying to rap. I tried it on my own and I know it's out of my talent reach. Irina brought us to a free area with two couches and two chairs around a chipped and beat up coffee table. It was sort of like what they had in the hotel room, only we were paying to be here and have other people around us that we weren't talking to. Zach grabbed one of the chairs and I sat on a couch right near him. Irina took everyone's order, which was still whiskey or beer. And when she got to me, she looked at Zach to see what she should do. Johnny, what soda do you like? He asked. Ginger ale, I told him. All soda is crap for the vocal cords, but ginger ale has a little less sugar and doesn't cause as much mucus production. I couldn't ask for diet in front of everyone though. Ginger ale on the rocks, Zach ordered which is what I was going to say from now on. He whispered something else to Irina before she went off. When she came back with our drinks and was handing out the last one to Zach, the DJ kicked into the latchkey's song, Frog Legs Franny. I caught Irina smiling at Zach, and I figured he'd requested it to impress the girls, but they were already impressed, so maybe he just wanted it anyway. They're with four groupies. Well, that's embarrassing, Zach said, after Irina left. By now, a bunch of people in our section were looking over at us, mostly at me and Zach. The Latchkeys talked about books and movies and musicians I hadn't heard of. They all had opinions on, on everything and used words like aesthetic and ideology and polemic. Maybe I knew more about slave autobiographies than them, but that was it. I thought about asking if they'd read The Confessions of Nat Turner, which was the best one I'd read so far because it was short, but also it has the most action, and Nat Turner kills a bunch of white people just with a small sword, like he's in Xenon, except he says he wants to slay his enemies with their own weapons, which in Xenon would mean stealing someone's weapon and using it against them, and I don't think the game actually lets you do that since you can't inspect an enemy's inventory until he's dead. They wouldn't know about Xenon though, so I stayed quiet. The girls didn't say as much, except for Vanessa, who used those kinds of words and argued with them all, especially Zach. Making smart music got you smart groupies who understood what you were doing with your sound, even if it meant a smaller overall bass. I had fans who never even heard of MJ. They were discussing the one movie I had seen, Back to the Future, and Zach was like, it represents not merely a nostalgic desire to regress to the safety of adolescence, but to the conservative 50s, the notion that we only have to roll back the biological and temporal clocks and we'll be happier. It's a total byproduct of the anxieties of the Cold War. The song that was playing switched into something familiar, and after a few bars I picked up that it was Summer Fling, but a remix club version I'd never heard before. It sounded decent, but it cut down my lyrics to the words, Summer Fling, two month thing, I wanna sing to my Summer Fling, and overlaid a lot of other beats not in the original song. My producer for that album, Charles, had the philosophy that the music had to hook the listener, but the vocals were what kept them there. And when you had someone with my vocal strength, 
you didn't mess around with overproduced songs. We probably got a good royalty rate for the sampling. Jane watches that stuff like a hawk. This one of yours, Zach asked me, and he gave me a little wink no one else could see, so I knew he'd requested it from Irina. I said it was, and he said it was cool and told the other latchkeys they should do their own remix about briefly dating the valedictorian of summer school called Summa Cum Laude Fling, <laughs> and took Vanessa's hand and danced with her. A ton of people in the crowd were dancing too, and even if it was only like a quarter of my original, it somehow felt cooler to watch people here dancing to it while I drank ginger ale than it did when they drank at my concerts, than when they danced at my concerts. Part of it was because the crowd was older and where we were, but the biggest reason was that Zach had requested the song, which meant he knew about the club remix already and he was dancing to it. The one thing I didn't like about the remix was the original has a long fade out where I'm singing the chorus over and over for about 30 seconds. And what I like about fade outs is how, after the song is over, it feels like it's still playing somewhere, only you can't hear it. It's a nice idea that just because you're not listening to a song in front of you doesn't mean it doesn't exist elsewhere. It works even better for some of Flink because it's like even this two-month relationship is going on in some way. That's why I'm singing about it forever. The remix had a hard stop. You know a song is over then. They ordered a second round of drinks from a new waitress and Zach asked for a double rye. When it came, he said, Johnny, Johnny, let me get some of your ginger ale. I handed it to him, and he brought it down below the coffee table with his rye and poured half his drink into mine. He passed it back to me without looking. The drink smelled mostly like ginger ale, <clears throat> but also like Jane's breath when she drank. I took a sip. It was sweet, but it stung my tongue like an arrow piercing your armor in xenon and slid down my throat like a mage's fireball that caused some damage. But it got easier with each sip until when I was halfway through, Zach reached for my glass again and dumped in the rest of his drink. The fireball fell inside my stomach, but it was a relaxing fireball, and it spread out like a smoke cloak in xenon for hiding yourself, and then it was like the damage was healing. What doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. Now I got why Jane does this. You don't worry about anything anymore. I could say something dumb that everyone knew about Back to the Future and not care how the latchkeys reacted. Like that, I thought the coolest part was how different everyone's lives became in the future after one little thing changed in the past. By the time I was almost done with my drink, Vanessa was sitting on Zach's lap on his chair and making out with him like in a music video. My vision was getting blurry. I didn't have the energy to keep it straight, so I only saw their outline. And then I had this picture in my head of Zach sitting in an armchair like the one he was in, but it was in a home, in a real living room, and there was a fireplace behind him, and he was reading the newspaper. And I went up to him as he patted his lap, and I crawled onto it and sat there while he read the paper. And the weirdest part was I was getting hard. Probably is because my eyes were sort of on Vanessa's legs, where her skirt was rotting up in her thighs, and I could almost see her underwear. So I focused my eyes on her there and got harder and shut my eyes totally and put my drink on the table and thought about what Vanessa looked like naked and humping her. Next thing I knew, someone was shaking me awake. It was Vanessa. Wake up, sleepy boy, she said, almost like Jane sleep singing, go to sleepy, little baby. I don't know how long I was out for, but it was worse than waking up early from Zolpidem. The latchkeys and the girls were all getting their stuff together and leaving. The nightclub was still pretty packed, though not as much as before. I swung my feet onto the ground and wobbled back to a sitting position on the couch before was Vanessa broke my fall backward with her arms. Easy there, fella, she said. Zach, help? Zach bent down right in front of me. His eyebrows looked concerned. A long lock of his hair touched my forehead. You okay, little man? I made sure I wasn't going to fall again before I stood up. I'm solid. Zach gave me a fake punch on the cheek, lightly touching it with his knuckles and said, cool, walk out with me. He put his jacket and hat on me and his hand on my back again. But this time I think it was to make sure I didn't collapse or depart the realm. 
We left through the secret passage from before, and there's a long line for cabs. But Irina let us cut in front and told us to come back any time. I went with Zach and Vanessa again. The cab ride seemed longer than the way there, since we were quieter, and time always goes slower after you've left something than before you've arrived. Zach sat in the middle, and after a few minutes, Vanessa leaned on his shoulder and fell asleep, and I got tired too, and my head found its way onto his other shoulder. But I wasn't falling asleep, and I didn't really want to be asleep. I just want to stay like that forever, smelling the cigarettes in his jacket I was wearing and his cologne me and him were both wearing, and resting on his shoulder as we drove silently in the dark of a strange city. We arrived at the hotel after the two other cabs. Zach and Vanessa took me up to my floor in the elevator. I was hoping we'd pretend to sneak around again, but I think they were too tired. They escorted me inside my room and took Zach's jacket and hat off me. Change into pajamas, Zach said. You don't want your mom asking why you're still in your clothes. While I changed in the bathroom, I was hoping Zach and Vanessa would say they were so tired, could they just crash on my couch? And I'd be like, yeah, I don't really like my bed, I kind of want to sleep on the couch too. So I'd go on one of the couches, they'd take the other two, and we'd have a sleepover like I used to have with Michael, and maybe we'd even make a cushion for it. I changed my clothes super fast so I could tell them they could crash there if they wanted, in case they were afraid to ask. But when I came out, they weren't in the living room. Zach, I called. They weren't in the bedroom either. I guess they wanted a real bed. I got under the covers. It had that feeling of being too big, like it was an ocean and I was a stone someone skipped in it, where you watch it carefully at first to count how many times it skips, and then it sinks, and you pick up the next stone and forget about the last one. Thanks, guys. Questions, if you've... Um by any chance, like read any interviews I've already done, I'm basically just going to repeat things I've said before with slightly different phrasings. <laughs> so don't, I, I can't be original. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm really happy to be doing this tonight because I, f I first met Teddy a few years ago right before Capitol was about to come out and it was the like, one of the very best first novels I had ever read and uh, and now Love Song of Johnny Valentine or Teddy Valentine uh, is it's, it's really it's the it's the one of the best second novels I've ever read and I'm really glad that I get to be part of the you know celebration of it this time around rather, um, so thanks. That's going on the cover. One of the best second novels I've ever read is the <laughs> blur from Kate Bowler. Um, so we're here to talk about the perils of fame. And so I thought I'd ask about why you chose child celebrity, childhood celebrity rather than adult. Uh, well, first of all, we should also acknowledge Kate Bullock is herself an adult celebrity right. <laughs> from her Atlantic magazine cover article last year. But um, I want to write about the entrepreneurial narcissism that's in our culture now, um, not just with celebrities, but regular people paparazzi themselves on Facebook or speaking about their personal brands and so on. And it's one thing if, say, Ashton Kutcher hawks himself as a product or a commodity. It's another thing when you see a child doing it, it becomes that much more toxic and pernicious. So through the, through the figure of a child, I think what's difficult or, or challenging about the way we're living now and the way we're, we're transforming ourselves as a culture becomes that much more visible, I believe. And I was, I was struck anew listening to you read that section um, by how sensitively uh, you drew Johnny and that he feels, I, don't, I didn't ever feel that he was condescended to. Um, and and the, your ability to imagine yourself into that kind of experience, not only a celebrity experience, but also a child's celebrity experience. And then also the way that you created this unified universe of, you know, the Xenon and his weight loss obsession and um, kind of music industry jargon. Um, but how, so he lives in a kind of everywhere land of buses and tours and hotel rooms, but you, I mean, that was pretty amazing, I thought. Um, anyway, that, that it feels so. And right now on that. <laughs> how, how cohesive it is. So yeah. anyway, so, so your portrait is so sensitively drawn. And I was wondering, did you, was there a kind of arc of aff affection? Did you start out feeling cynical about tween slubs and then come to a fondness or? The, the original it? impulse was satirical and probably more judgmental. 
Um, the way I got the idea for the book was I've been tutoring at uh, this after school program in Brooklyn. I'd seen a young girl reading Miley Cyrus's book, Miles to Go. Um, I didn't really think much of it at the time, but it's like a, a picture book with like a sentence on every page. Um, they, they, were, they were reading great stuff there. And a week later or so, a friend emailed me asking if I wanted to collaborate on a humor book. Did I have any ideas? And I said, how about we parody these like child star, pop star, like fake memoirs basically. They're essentially advertorial books. And an hour later I realized this is not a bad idea for a novel if I treat it seriously too. So we, we abandoned the parody idea about a week later. I began writing it as a novel that, that very day though. Um, I did write a, a parody section that ended up in the book in a, in a different way. But I'd say my initial impulse was to judge and be condescending in some form. And as I started writing it more, even from that first draft and that first day, I became more empathetic or it was drawn into the empathy of the character. And by the end, I'd say that I think there's no judgments about the character himself. Maybe the world around him is satirically rendered, but I don't think the main character, there's anything implausible or condescending, at least from my intention. <laughs> And, uh, and what about the research that you did? I know you read a Bieber autobiography. What else did you I had to read do? a lot about Bieber. Um, not that the book is based on him, as the Simon Schuster legal team has commanded me to say every time. <laughs> but uh, what did I do? I read in various celebrity biographies, autobiographies, um, going back as far as the 1920s, Jackie Coogan is like the first child star in, t in movies. Uh, I watched various documentaries, um, would read things like Tiger Beat and, and their websites, which you can waste a lot of time doing that um, and you get sucked in. I now know at least a couple of the One Direction boys names, which I wish <laughs> I didn't really. Um, so there's, there's a lot, there's like deeper end of the pool and shallower end of the pool research that I did. Um, from, from real books, like a cultural critical book about child stars to Tiger Beat's website, which is Tiger Beat has merged with a thing called Pop, I think it's called, um, which again is a thing I wish I didn't know now, but now I do. <laughs> so did you notice any trends or patterns over time? With, it, with, with like teen? How, how, yeah, how, how teen celebs are presented or how they present themselves? That's a good question. Um, I, you know, one thing I noticed is that all boy groups have five members. Seems to be the way they do it. So One Direction has five. Uh, what's their New Kids on the Block had five. Most of the the bigger and Sync, I think Backstreet Boys too. That seems to be the magic number. But only one of the kids ever makes it out and has a success, successful career afterward. Tops. So it's Justin Timberlake or uh, who's the other? There's another obvious one. Ricky Martin. Mark Wahlberg, yes. So one of them makes it, the other four you never hear from again. Um, but I think that'd be a much more fun way to go through teen celebrity if you have to go through it. If, the, if you do it on your own, you really run the risk of, you know, dying actually, like, you know, fading out in some serious way or, or overdosing or whatever. If you do it with your friends, you might have the semblance of some sort of family structure around you. So I'm assuming that it wasn't a passion for top 40 music that led you here. And uh, so what was that like? Why, why did you choose top 40 pop stuff? And what was it like? Did you listen to a lot of it? Did you gain an appreciation for it? Or did you have a secret love for it going in? I didn't have a secret love. I mean, like anyone else, if, it's, if this pop song is catchy, I'll enjoy it. Um, most literary novels that are about music understandably are about, or that are about but popular music are about rock because most writers who like popular music like rock and don't like pop that much. It's also an art form that's equivalent or worthy of the novel form, you, you could say. I like rock too, that's my preferred kind of music, but pop music, for better or worse, is probably more representative of how America works and functions as a capitalist structure. It's heavily overproduced music. There's great division of labor and how it's made. You have a producer, a songwriter, a melody writer, an engineer. The artist has nothing to do with it himself. So I want to explore capitalism and, and how that works for art, the commerce of art, through the music that is most commercial and not the music that's most artistic. And so I, I kind of touched on this earlier, but um, Johnny's point of view and his uh, 
his narration is this brilliant combination of marketing jargon, kind of savvy business speak, and then also just little kind of plaintive 11 year old boy um, sensitivity or, or vulnerability. And, um, it, and it ends up being really funny and really sad at the same time to, to read it all the way through. And so I was wondering how you came up with that combination. How did you come up with that point of view as a way of representing uh, Johnny? And did it have anything to do with that kind of an eternal problem of how to make an ostensibly uninteresting person sound interesting on the on the page? Right. There is the problem of how do you have a child narrator narrate a book that adults would want to read? So most people get around it by having twelve-year-olds who are who are geniuses who speak like college professors, and I want to avoid that. But you still can't have occasionally you can have a, a child that sounds like a child, and somehow adults want to read it. But it's hard to do. So uh, for about two years, I freelance wrote this business column. I don't know how I ended up getting this column. It was through a friend. But um, I would interview people about media and marketing. And each week would talk to someone in the field who used business and marketing jargon, very unironically, building their personal brand and the digital space and all these phrases that, to me, I would never want to use in my personal life. And I, I wondered also, do they use them in their personal lives? Are they at home talking about domestic outreach or whatever. <laughs> um, and so I, I thought about if I can have this, this really mercenary, almost crass lingo collide with the innocent grammar of a preteen, it could be an interesting combination. And the opposite of an innocent child who wants only love from you, one of the opposites would be a predatory marketer who wants to sell you something you don't need. So. That was from the start, his voice, I think I refined a little bit more. At first it was a little bit too childlike, um, but it, it turned out to be a fun combination to use. And I think probably every page, there wasn't much in that section I read, but most pages there are at least a few marketing lingo phrases that Johnny uses that hopefully are, are seamlessly integrated. Yeah, and, and just even the way his thought patterns move, um, he'll be, and, and I think he did have examples in that section that he's just kind of having experience and then immediately thinking about, well, overproduced, whatever, I don't know. I mean, what the example, but it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's very um, convincing. And you're, um, you use the first person a lot. So Capitoil is in the first person and a lot of your humor writing and if not all of your humor I mean do you always use the first person not not uh, not necessarily for humor I don't think maybe no not always for humor but yeah. for fiction that I've only written two novels so they are both there like that um, I I'm drawn to ventriloquism not in like practice but in writing uh, but I actually I do friends who are good at doing voices and I see one of them right here I always appreciate and much enjoy friends who can imitate other voices. A few months ago I saw the movie, the documentary Being Elmo. I saw it before the Elmo scandal broke. Um, so, and I was, I was taken by the puppeteers process. It sounds weird, but I was very impressed by how puppeteers come up with characters. It's through voice and not, not anything else. They, they, already, they have a puppet built up already. It's like the fabric's there and then they suddenly do a voice. So for Elmo, Elmo existed before the Elmo we know him as it is to, as he is today, um, in a different voice. It was like this gruff old man almost, and it didn't work. And obviously, no kids liked it. And they gave it to a new guy, the guy who now does Elmo or, or did Elmo, I guess. And he just sort of immediately came up with this Elmo voice, and from there developed the Elmo character, as if like you know, it's just unconscious, just once you get the voice, you know how to do it. And I do feel like that's how I've been working with novels, at least, and maybe humor pieces, too. Huh. And so, and how does the voice lead the character? Did, so it, it must bring you in directions you wouldn't normally go as, as Teddy. I, I think, you know, again, if you see friends maybe doing an impression of someone, they start, if they're doing it sort of joking, jokingly, which is usually when you do an impression, you create new inroads and paths without really thinking about it. Almost the voice leads you there yourself. And I found that way. I don't want to get too mystical or new agey about it, like, oh, I just follow the voice. But I think that there is something to that. And that next time you see someone doing an impression of someone, 
you'll notice they don't really have to think through what the next speech pattern is. They might already have one built up there that they're imitating, but you can develop more and more just by, by, by getting into that person's uh, vocal rhythms. Huh. It's, I think it's such a useful uh, trick Like you should tell creative writing students to do that. You know, because it's so easy to write in the first person when you're kind of writing yourself, but to be writing into a different character really does bring you into different imaginative worlds. I think I do an exercise when I teach uh, creative writing where it's something like write from the perspective of the gender that's not your own, which is a pretty stock exercise, but I think even that is, is useful. Yeah, I want to try it. I don't write fiction, but I want to try. Um, yeah, so, and Johnny, the, the world that you existed for him to live in is very contemporary and full of glossy magazines and pop culture references and, and again, very convincing and really also keeps a unified thread through his touring um, because he lives in, inside of celebrity culture. He doesn't live in the real world that the rest of us live in. And so it works beautifully for the book. And do you worry about the book seeming dated later on or how, how it will age? That, that's a, a, a legitimate concern, you know, we're not going to be using, say, Twitter or Facebook 20 years from now, at least the way we use it now, and there are references to it throughout the book. But we also don't ride in stagecoaches or worship the Olympian gods anymore, and we still read those stories. So in one way, you can get away with it, because the important thing is to get a snapshot of the time, and hopefully you write something that is somehow timeless nonetheless. Um, which we'll only learn 20 years from now if people are still reading this book or anything like that. But I, I enjoy books that try to try to focus on the present and feel like they could have only been written in this time period. I don't really like reading fiction that could have well been written in 1913 instead of 2013. I think if we're living now, make use of it. Not, not to mean you have to set it in the present, but show that you're alive in the, in the world around you and that you're making use of, of the presence. And, and also part of that world that you've created for him, it's, um they're also the you know key, there, you've, there's, there's Michael Jackson, um, but otherwise he meets only, Johnny meets only fictional celebrities and he plays an unnamed video game system that you invented and um, it sounds very real. So why did you create an alternate universe that's fictional rather than real? Um, well, given that Johnny is himself totally fictional, not based on anyone either, um, I, I, don't, I don't love it in movies especially, or TV shows, but books too, when real life celebrities make cameos, it always feels kind of hacky to me. Like here's the moment when Frank Sinatra comes in, and in a movie it's like someone who looks vaguely like Frank Sinatra, comes in and says one line that's very Frank Sinatra-ish, and then leaves. So those kind of caricature, it lends itself to caricature because you're reduced to that sole possibility of write it like this guy. Whereas if you make up Zach Ford, instead of using, say, say Julian Casablancas of the Strokes, who he probably looks a little bit like, if it's, Zach, if it's Julian Casablancas, I have to make it like that guy, who's not even that sort of well, we don't even know what he's like, really. But it, whereas Zach Ford, I can make him whatever I want, and I'm not reduced and hemmed in. Um, and, and you get away from that caricature, hacky cameo possibility. And then, and so why Michael Jackson is the kind of patron saint? He, I mean, one, he's probably the, the, the most brilliant pop artist of the last 30 plus 35 years now, 40 years, um, unparalleled for the kind of music that Johnny would be making. Um, he's also the guy who's probably the celebrity in history who's most been warped by his fame, especially his childhood fame. So that Johnny emulates him and, and admires him and reveres and wants to become him is his very misguided mission. You don't want to be turned into Michael Jackson eventually. You want to turn in, probably if you're in this world, into someone who does it for a few years and gets out unscathed and, and goes on to a semblance of normal life. But Jackson and, and people who in that strata, unless they're tremendous business people, which Michael Jackson wasn't really, or had their head screwed on very straight, which he also didn't, or have good people around you, which he didn't, you basically can't survive. And, uh, and Johnny, I think, isn't even totally aware that Michael Jackson is not the kind of person you want to become. Did you know all that about Michael Jackson beforehand? Or did you do more research on In him? the way that we all know about it. I read yeah. some books about him. There's an excellent 
John Jeremiah Sullivan article, uh, essay about Michael Jackson, and a very good book by a woman named Margot Jefferson. Uh, but, you know, I think we all know the basic arc of his story. Yeah, and it's, it's also nice as far as the fictional world goes to have this real life person as an anchor yeah. as, as for the reader experience. Right, I, I think if he wanted to become so badly this other person who was his guiding light, there is this guy named Tyler Beats in the book who is not based on Justin Timberlake at all. But um, <laughs> there is there is a fictional character to that. But if if this truly this beacon for him were also made up, it would feel a little lackluster, I think. Yeah. And uh, and it did 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 you find that the childhood celebrity ever exceeded your imagination, the reality of it? Yeah. I mean, even with with Bieber, there's been strange parallels since the book was finished. Uh, a couple of small things, but then the weirdest one has been. Johnny at some point has a stalker who shows up to a concert. I won't give anything away, but Bieber had this horrific thing a few months ago with two men from New Mexico who want to kidnap, castrate, and murder him. Um, and it's the sort of thing that probably three years ago before I worked on this book, I would have reacted like most people would have reacted, which is you're a little horrified and then you kind of find it funny because it's bizarre. They want to castrate him. It's so outrageous. The only response is to laugh. And now that I've written this, not that I'm a, a much better person for having written this or anything, but I, I have a little, I have more sympathy for someone who's, he's 18, who has to hear about two strange men in their 40s who want to castrate him. Um, and I think that's, in general now, I'm, I'm much less quick to, to mock or to scoff at the plight of celebrities who, who, who are somehow suffering. They are like human beings still. We can forget it easily. And they don't always act like they are. They often act like this sort of deified immortals. But they're still a human being at the end of the day. At the end of that day, Bieber had to be told by someone, these two men want to castrate you, which is a, a terrible thing to be told. I've been told that many times. It's, not, <laughs> it's never good. <laughs> Um, well, do, do, do other people have questions for Teddy? Yep. Um, I was curious if you uh, yeah. uh, I was curious if you had Arc Music Factory. Do you know uh, that in your head, like the Rebecca Black Yeah, yeah, people? yeah. yeah. Did I've, I've listened to the song Friday many times. <laughs> um, and they, I mean, they just make all their money from 11-year-old people, so I was just curious about if that was something you had in your head while you were writing. I, I actually probably didn't have it in my head in, in very consciously, but I, like everyone else, watched the Friday video and was, it's actually, the weird thing about that video and song, it's, 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 it's an awful song, but it's also sort of good. Like, it wouldn't have taken off if it weren't catchy, too. For those of you who don't know, namely my parents, um, <laughs> this song, Friday, was this, arc music is this, exploitative thing that gets rich parents to pay money to have their kids be in music videos. And the one that went viral was this one by a girl, which is the worst music video of all time, but it's so bad it's very good too. Um, but that's, that's part of this culture of 13 year olds wanting to be famous at all costs and not realizing how silly they look and not really thinking through what it might mean later on. So I, if I wasn't constantly thinking about it, it's, it's part of the, the cultural ether that's, that was swirling around me. Questions? Not really a question, but I thought that the quintessential scene in it, in the book, was, it just shows everything. It's the whole, almost the whole trajectory of what you're trying to do. It was the scene with uh, Lisa, I forget her last name. Lisa Pinto, who's not Pinto. based on Selena Gomez. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Selena who? <laughs> um, you know, just going to his old house and the, tr the, the buses are there and he's trying to, she's loving him and then all of a sudden it's done and she's gone and I just thought that was in so many ways that I haven't mentioned um, really a terrific scene, a great piece. Thank you. The book just came out today, so you must have read it all today. I did. Somehow. <laughs> Incredible. Speed reader. Other questions? Oh, come on. Yeah. Really? Yes, there you go. <laughs> 
Uh, hello. Well, thank you for reading. It sounds terrific. And um, I was wondering if you had any favorite reactions to your work, positive or negative, so far. I love all the negative ones. They're great. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm just pleased when people take the time to read like a 300-page book. It's always uh, gratifying, but you know, it's it's moving that someone's taking this time to read several hours of your work. Um, but no, I, I just, you know, I'm happy if someone's doing it. Even if they don't like it, I'm just, I'm still kind of impressed that they, that they took the time to read it. How many people were you sharing uh, drafts with while you were working on it and, or taking a critique from? Several people, some of them were here. Maura Kelly, Sarah Bruni. I might be missing some other people, but maybe uh, not as I was working on it, but as I finished the first draft, I think maybe six or seven people. Uh, I had a question, sorry. Um, could you tell me a little bit about sort of how you created the character of Jane? Because I'm sort of fascinated that in so many ways she's like a terrible mother and an unsympathetic character, but you still end up sort of caring about her by the end of it, and she's still sort of... It almost, it, it does seem like in her own way she has his best interests at heart, um, which is sort of a weird line to, or like a difficult line to thread. I was just wondering how you sort of created that. Yeah, I mean, Dina Lohan would be like the, the momager that everyone <laughs> looks to. Um, and I think that the stage mom is such a, an archetype by now that it was risky to, to have one like that, uh, to have her be such a, a central figure. And she probably started off more superficial and stereotypical and through various drafts from some of those people who I mentioned before my editor Millicent uh, Bennett who's here uh, I think every time nearly she did something cruel or, or selfish I figured the best way to do it to counter was to balance it with an act a selfless act or a loving act or something tender from her if I hadn't done that, she'd be a very one-dimensional character. I'm, I'm pleased that people have felt that she's complicated. Um, I, I don't. I, I do feel like even if she ends up on the on the on the harsher side, on balance, there's enough loving, tender moments from her that redeem her. Okay. Um, I. One of the things that I was impressed with is that, yes, this is a celebrity child, but I still hear the child uh, in the reading. And I was wondering if you had explored or had any experiences with an 11-year-old who is not a celebrity. Well, I, I, I tutored kids, so maybe that's part of it, but I, I don't, they weren't kids who were like him, so I wouldn't say that was it. Uh, you could just say I'm emotionally stunted, and I'm not far from that, but uh, I actually relate to Johnny in some ways now as an adult more than my childhood self. Um, professionally, certainly, it's his second album, it's my second book. I can connect on some level with what it's like to be a working artist who's, who's concerned about your future, which he very much is. His stakes are much higher than mine, but when it's your own life, you, you care the most of anyone anyway. So I, yeah, I, I, I don't know if, if like I tapped into my adolescent self tremendously. I actually feel like it was more things I might be going through now and, and partly to make it readable to adults. If it were really like an 11 year old, uh, yeah, there is, a, the, I hope, an authentic childhood self in there, but I think it's, he's a very adult child, um, which is also this interesting idea about the, the child star, which is that they're not quite children, not quite adults, they occupy this strange nether region. And that's what I was aiming for with, throughout, that he's not really a kid, he's not really an adult, he's somewhere in between and it's not clear where. Uh, can you talk about um, covering Johnny's song um, and uh, writing, actually hearing the music that you were thinking of? Sure. Are you referring to my own acoustic version of the song? Yeah. yeah. I, uh, Johnny's hit song is called Guys vs. Girls. I wrote the full, the lyrics are fully in the book. I'm a, I'm a pretty bad guitarist and singer. So I, I would write the songs and kind of strum my guitar and come with the lyrics. Um, and eventually got the full song for I think it's four verses and a chorus. And then recorded it. I fortunately got a, a real musician to record it too and a website put it on last week. 
it might be on the real radio. No, I'm serious, like not like the new hit by Teddy Wayne. Um, on an interview, they might possibly play a snippet soon, which would kind of be scary and great to be on the radio for once. <laughs> um, but I like playing, you know, guitar. I'm, I, I wish I were better. I, I'm, just, I'm not. And uh, I think it was probably helpful that I could do it a little bit so I have a sense of how a melody might go. But the, the lyrics in the book, I think, are somewhat, have some verisimilitude. They're not satirical send-ups of pop song lyrics as far as I was striving for. They are, they could be used in, in, in real songs. Um, so maybe someday a record label will purchase them and I'll be able to quit writing and go into music. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering how much of a sense of the plot you had when you started writing or how much came from discovering the character of Johnny and how he interacted with Jane or what your process is. It, it was mostly there from the start. I, I like to outline uh, novels somewhat loosely and then fill them in the more I go. And I don't think anything major change. Uh, Millicent could, could speak to this better, but I don't think by the time I gave it to Millicent that tremendous structural changes. Millicent made a ton of line edits and, and tightened up scenes, but I don't think plot points were shifted around too much. And I think as, as I wrote it, the same thing. Um, so I, 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 for my first book, I, I did tremendously revise. Josh Henkin, who's here, read a draft of it and gave me the, the most important editorial feedback I've had in my life, which he really recommended I change it a lot, uh, the last third of it, which I did. Um, but for this one, I think it's actually kind of luck that it, it, it seemed to work out better on the first attempt. Any more questions? We'll take one more question. Now? Oh. Teddy, it's funny how uh, life works out because I was walking my son home from school today. He's 11, and he announced to me that Justin Bieber has no balls. So I don't know how he could have been a plan for castration, but that's not the question. Um, I was wondering how long you work on these, because I've been working on a book for three and a half years, uh, second revision, and. I'm just so over it. I just want to do something else. And I just wonder, you know, how long each of these took you to do. And I loved Capitol. Thank I look you. forward to this one. Um, so I should first say maybe I wrote a book before my first book was published that never got published and was probably two years, two plus years of work. Capitol took like three and a half years start to finish. And then I was working on another thing after Capitol before this for about a year that I threw out because I wasn't enjoying it. This one came quickly. Uh, I think about the first draft was six months and then another year and a half of revisions with, with Millicent uh, included. So this one was quicker, but I think it's partially again, I got lucky and found something I enjoyed working on. I had few, fewer distractions this time around than last time I was teaching a lot more before I was in grad school. Um, but I think, you know, probably three years, three and a half years is, is pretty par for the course, if not more. And uh, probably the, the real thing is if you keep enjoying it, it's still worth pursuing. And if you don't enjoy it, which is what I was not, not enjoying the previous one before this, it's worth dropping, because why, why continue something that's so difficult and onerous if you're not enjoying it? But keep it up, let me end on a good note. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's probably it for now. I can sign books. Yeah, right? thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.